It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Philip Getson. Dr. Getson is, a, is board certified in family medicine. He's been in practice for 34 years in New Jersey. He's an internationally recognized expert in the diagnosis and treatment of reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome, and he has lectured extensively on the subject. He's Assistant Professor of Medicine in Neurology at Drexel University Hospital in Philadelphia. Dr. Getson is a board-certified thermologist and has reviewed more than 10,000 thermographic studies of the breast, thyroid, and neuromuscular system. He's been certified by four thermographic boards and has lectured in the U.S. and Canada regarding thermographic testing. He is also uh, author of several papers on the subject. Dr. Getson currently serves as the medical liaison to the New Jersey Department of Health to impl implement the governor's bill for RSD awareness, and he will be responsible for conducting educational lectures on the subject. Dr. Getson will speak to us uh, today on safe early screening and monitoring with thermal imaging. Please welcome Dr. Philip Getson. I can't stand still, I have to walk. So you've heard today about what to do uh, to prevent, to forestall breast cancer, to make yourself healthy. My role is to talk to you about how you can visualize changes in the breast that will tell you that something is malfunctioning. Now in order to do this and in order to understand thermography, there are a couple of things that I have to preface this with. First, you have to understand the difference between anatomic testing and physiologic testing in medicine. Anatomic testing looks for lesions, it looks for tumors, it looks for cysts, it looks for um, uh, blood vessels. Physiologic testing talks about how the breast works. How is it functioning? Is it functioning properly? And in medicine, physiology always precedes anatomy. And in breast physiology, by seven to 10 years. So what that means is that thermography, which is the only physiologic test for breast disease, can tell you if the breast is malfunctioning seven to 10 years before a mammogram will find a tumor the size of a pencil eraser. And so the real question arises is, what would you do if you knew sooner? How would you change your life? And everyone who has preceded me, every, every lecture that you've heard today, every thought process was about what to change. And so I'm going to show you how we do thermographic testing, before which, however, I'm going to talk to you just briefly about mammography. Now, by show of hands, women in the room, how many women in the room have had a mammogram? Okay, that's pretty much every woman in the room. By show of hands, how many women have found it a pleasant experience and they were looking forward to the next one? <laughs> okay, so there's zero, which by the way, that my, my streak is intact, it is still zero. I haven't yet at any one of these lectures ever had anybody raise their hand. So the point at hand is that a mammogram is an uncomfortable test at the very least. And recognize that when they do a mammogram, they are taking the breast and they are putting it between two metal plates with a pressure of 50 pounds, 5-0, 50 pounds, three bowling balls, 50 pounds of weight and compressing this nice soft tissue that is the breast. And the American Cancer Society tells you that the number one cause of, rate of, of cancer in the breast is radiation. So doesn't it make sense in this country that we radiate the breast to find out if you have a disease that comes from radiating the breast? Now, Understand that this country is one of the few countries where mammography is considered the gold standard. In Europe, it is not. In Germany, they don't even do mammograms. It starts with thermography and branches out. But because of our FDA and because of the politics in this country, and I will say no more on the subject, we start with mammography. Also understand that conventional medical doctors, Dr. Warner said she's a recovering allopath. I'm a recovering conventional medical doctor. Conventional medical doctors are told, this is the only way to go. You've got to do a mammogram. Why? There is something else. There are a lot of something else. There's ultrasound, an anatomic test with ultrasound waves, non-invasive, non-compressive, non-radiologic. There's MRI, which I admit to you requires the injection of a dye, 
which is water soluble and is excreted within 24 hours. But the fact of the matter is there are other ways to go. I had a question earlier today about a woman who said to me, I wanted to have a ma an MRI, but they told me I had to have a mammogram first. Baloney. There is no such rule. There is no such law. Same story with an ultrasound. There is no such rule. It is the way that it's done, but there's nobody that says it has to be that way. So if you want to have an ultrasound, it's your body, it's your money, it's your insurance, go have an ultrasound or an MRI. But let's talk about mammograms briefly. And what I'm going to show you are not my impressions, because that would not be suitable for camera, but it is going to be statistic. On November 16, 2009, the U.S. Preventative Task Force for Breast Screening recommendations, U.S. Preventative Task Force, the federal government, my friends, said rather than benefiting from screening, women with cancer may incur harm with undergoing mammography, additional imaging, and biopsies. This made the front of the New York Times. This made CNN. They interviewed a notable breast surgeon at UCLA Medical Center, and she sat there, it was a female breast surgeon, she sat there and said, we need an, a better breast test. And my wife and I jumped up in front of the television and we're screaming at the TV, we have a better breast test. <laughs> I don't think anybody heard us, but the fact of the matter is, this is what the government said in 2009. They also said, don't start getting mammograms until you're 50, because the breasts are too dense between 40 and 50 to be able to get a quality image. Hasn't changed anything in this country, but that's what they said. In December of last year, the British Medical Journal, these are all big, reputable institutions, confirmed that breast cancer screenings, specifically mammograms, may cause women more harm, especially during the early years after they start screening. This harm is largely due to surgery, such as lumpectomy and mastectomies and other often unnecessary in interventions. Last year, there were 800,000 unnecessary biopsies. In this country, 800,000, a staggering number. And statistically, of all the biopsies done, 80% are benign. The New England Journal of Medicine, probably the, the most reputable uh, periodical in this country, in, in uh, September of 2010 stated 2,500 women would have to be screened over 10 years for a single breast cancer death to be avoided. And in a Newsweek article, December 10, 2011, Dr. Susan Love said that at least 30% of tumors found on mammograms would go away if you did absolutely nothing. Finally, the Nordic Cochrane Center, you should understand, in Norway, the Nordic Cochrane Center does more research on breast disease than anywhere else in the world. And normally, as Dr. Warner and I were talking about earlier, they don't take a position. They're pretty much just laying information out there. And they said it no long, no, therefore no longer seems reasonable to attend for breast cancer screening. They were talking about mammography. They went on the next page to do that. In fact, by avoiding going to a screening, a woman will lower her risk of getting a breast cancer diagnosis. So in this country, we're doing mammograms. Why? Samuel Epstein, who was professor of environmental and occupational medicine at the University of Illinois, said there was clear evidence that the breast, particularly in premenopausal women, is highly sensitive to radiation, with estimates of increased risk up to 1% for every radiation absorbed dose. Now, I talked to you before about compression. Compression is an evil of mammography. Radiation, we are being told as, as conventional medical uh, personnel that the radiation is low dose. And to a degree, that's true. But it's a big difference if you take low dose in a field that goes from your shoulders to your hips or if you bring it down to a four or five inch area because it's the same radiation in a cone. So it's low dose, but that's not the entire story. Charles Simone, who worked for the National Cancer Institute, said mammograms increase the risk of developing breast cancer and raise the, uh, raise the risk of spreading or metastasizing an existing growth. Dr. Simone also said, and these numbers are not typographical errors, that since 1983, the incidence of DCIS, which, by the way, in the minds of many medical professionals is not cancer at all, but rather precancerous, okay, which represents 12% of all breast cancers, and that word probably should be in quotes, but this is a quote, has increased by 328%, 200% of which is due to the use of mammography. He's saying, in case we're missing this, that the mammograms are causing the DCIS. 
and then under, under 40 age group by 3,000%. Okay, so they're telling you that we're trying to detect breast cancers early. Now, let me offer a point. Cancer is the only disease entity in this country that we don't look at proactively. If your parents were diabetics, they're doing diabetes screens when you're 15 years old. If your parents had high lipids, high blood pressure, I don't care, pick a disease, they're screening you. But we're waiting until you get cancer and then we're treating it. Why? Simple answer. Cancer is big business. Pharmacologic lo lobbies are making money. And so as a result, they don't really want you to do early detection. They don't want what we're talking about today, diet change, lifestyle change, stress reduction. Okay. But for early detection, look at this statistic. By the time a tumor has grown to sufficient size to be detected by a mammogram, it has been growing for seven to 10 years. Now, that's an interesting number, seven to 10 years, if you think back five or 10 minutes ago, because I said to you that thermography will find a breast cancer physiologically seven to 10 years before a mammogram will find it. And these numbers are what it gives you. At 90 days, there's two cells, and when you come down to eight years, that's four trillion cells or 32 times the amount. So it's simple logic to realize that if you get a breast cancer physiologically at a year or even two years, the chances of correcting the problem, reversing the disease, making something go away or at least stopping it from growing becomes much better at 256 than it does at 4 trillion. In 1928, Dr. 1928, Dr. Quigley wrote, be, be careful of handling cancerous breasts for fear of accidentally disseminating cells. Now, if you take a breast that has a cancer in it, you put it between two 50-pound plates and you compress the breast, what happens to the cancer cells? 1928, they knew. So the face of medicine is changing, and the face of medicine is changing for two reasons, one of which is that women drive health care. Now, make no mistake about it, women drive health care. And for all the men in the room, if you don't believe it, okay, I'm telling you that when a man walks into my office, I'm wondering where the woman is that sent him there. <laughs> all right. What women, however, are, are unable to control is who made the mammographic equipment, because if they had, <laughs> it would have looked like this. So women driving health care are saying, we don't want this anymore. We don't want our breasts compressed, and if you're going to do it, how would you feel? <laughs> Women want better. Women want the non-compression, the non-radiation. They want the safety factor. They want to know they want to do something about it. Women want to take care of themselves. And so they do this by being proactive. They do this by showing up on a Saturday and spending their day listening to us talk. And so we're going to talk about early detection of breast disease thermographically. Now, whereas mammograms, as I said, are radiologic compressive studies, and, and ultrasounds are sound waves, and MRIs are non-radiation but somewhat confining with an injection study, we now have a study that has no compression, no radiation, no injections, no dyes, no risk factor. We are dealing with the infrared spectrum of, of light which means that you're standing in front of a camera that is taking the heat off of your body and creating a picture of it. It is literally from the Greek thermography, thermogram means heat picture, because all of us generate heat. And the, and the premise behind this is that the body is a symmetrical entity. So I'm not comparing me to him, I'm comparing me to me. The left side of my body should be the same as the right side of my body. Now, nobody's identical, and there are built-in parameters that I, as the interpreter, have to employ. But the bottom line is, if we're in fact symmetrical, and you take a picture of me, my body should be a mirror image, left to right. And if it is, it's normal. And if it isn't, it's not. It really is just that simple. The point is, if we are able to identify an area that is not symmetrical, it has to have some kind of meaning. And that meaning allows individuals to take control. It allows people to say, okay, I'm gonna go have that ultrasound as a follow-up to your thermogram. And if that ultrasound's negative, I'm not gonna stop there. I'm gonna go back and I'm going to implement everything you've heard today. I'm going to implement hormonal balance. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce my stress. I'm going to change my diet. 
I'm going to make sure that I have natural supplements. So I'm going to do everything that you heard today because, as I will show you momentarily, you can reverse the thermogram. And if you're reversing the thermogram, then you're reversing the pathology. You're making yourself better because everything everybody said today is sort of out there. And I'm going to show you visually that you can do that. And if you can do that, why wouldn't you? I mean, isn't that why you're here? And isn't that the message we should all be carrying? So in 1972, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare validated thermography. For those people who ask me, well, how come we've never heard of it? Is it new? Here's the answer to the question. In the 1940s, during the Second World War, the government had thermographic technology. And they armed fighter planes to fly over missile silos. And the missile silos that came up hot on the thermogram were the ones actively making missiles, and they bombed them. And the ones that came up cold were inert. They weren't working in those places, and they flew over them. So the government, as they do, held on to it for about 10 or 12 years. And in the 1950s, they released it for medical applications. That means the thermographic equipment is 10 years older than mammography. Obviously, in the 50, 60, 70 years that have transpired, there have been great technological advances. The point is that this is a test that the government recognized through the Health, Education, and Welfare in 1972. So yes, it's been out there and been recognized. The other thing that I will tell you is that the, the uh, FDA approves the cameras, and the American Medical Association in 1982, which is the, the year I got into thermography, approved this as a diagnostic test for breast disease. That being said, who should have a thermogram? Well, OK. Patients at high risk by family history, breast implants, dense breasts, surgical scars, inconclusive anatomic studies, patients with condition making, uh, conditions making breast compression impossible, such as neur neurologic conditions like reflex sympathetic dystrophy, like fibromyalgia type things, and patients wishing to avoid radiation and compression, which since nobody told me they wanted to go back and have another mammogram, means everybody in the room. So it's, it's really something for everyone because you can stand in front of a thermographic camera every day for the rest of your life without harm because it's not giving, it's taking. And that's what makes it safe. Okay. Christine Horner, who wrote uh, Waking the Warrior Goddess uh, after her mother died from breast cancer and who was a, a breast surgeon, um, quoted a study from the American Journal of Radiology in 2003. Understand the American Journal of Radiology, like like radiology itself is a sort of a Bible of radiologists or doctors who read x-rays and mammograms, said that infrared imaging offers a safe, non-invasive procedure that would be valuable as an adjunct to mammography in determining whether a lesion is benign or malignant. She further said the warning, pa warming, I'm sorry, warning patterns seen by thermography have been found to resolve and return to normal after only a few short months of healthy diet and lifestyle changes. Yeah. It's the recurrent theme of the day, healthy diet and lifestyle changes. She said this is the first tool we have that shows promise of being able to pick up breast cancers so early at a stage that involves only precancerous changes that it can, women can reverse these changes and avoid getting breast cancer by making a few simple diet and lifestyle modifications. Christine Northrup, who many of you probably know of, uh, and who is a, a, an international expert on women's health, said thermography is a breast health screening modality that actually helps prevent breast cancer, not just diagnose it early. I highly recommend this approach. And on a personal note, Dr. Northrup was kind enough to have me be with her last October during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which for us is a misnomer because every month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But last October, and we did a show on Hay House Radio together internationally, uh, the topic of which was thermography as an early diagnosis for breast disease. It is in the archives on Hay House Radio, um, and it was, it was a great honor for me. And the response that I got, I get emails from all over the world for weeks because women, again, all over the world are looking at something different. And there's a lot of people who never heard of this. Dr. Mercola, who is well known to everybody for his, for his website, said thermographic breast screening is brilliantly simple, and he, in fact, has thermographic imaging in his, uh, in his facility. So before I talk about this, I, I, I want to just tell you how I got involved in this and, and the passion that I have with thermography. In 1982, some business people approached me and they said, we would like you to, to, to buy a thermographic camera. I didn't know anything about thermography, so I did some research and I said, well, okay, what am I going to do with it? Um, and at that point in time, the technology was such that we started doing neuromuscular studies. We started looking at the, the neuromuscular system and accident-related injuries. 
And we felt we really had something great. We thought that this was going to be a great diagnostic tool to help everybody get a better picture of the injuries that people had sustained in motor vehicle related accidents in New Jersey. Well, the insurance industry disagreed with me, which came as no real great surprise. And so we would send bills and they would ignore us saying we're not going to pay this. So I said, well, if that's the case, I'm going to sue you. And I was very fortunate. I had a friend who was an attorney who was independently wealthy, and he could afford to take the case on pro bono for me, which he did. And we sued all states, State Farm, and the state of New Jersey. I figure if you're going to sue an insurance company, I might as well start at the top. <laughs> so we had a trial in Camden County that lasted seven weeks. Every day for seven weeks, I went to court and sat in court in a suit and a tie and listened to testimony. I was very fortunate. My colleagues in the thermographic industry flew in from all over the country on their own. And we fought all state and state farm for seven weeks. At the end of which, the judge, there was no jury, the judge rendered a verdict that we won, that we had proved beyond a reasonable doubt that thermography was a valid diagnostic tool for neuromuscular injuries. Well, all state and state farm were not going to take that, so they decided they were going to appeal it. And about a year and a half or two years later, uh, the appellate division heard the thing and they said, no, nope, we're upholding the lower courts, you win. So all state and state farm appealed it and they took it to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey. And so we went to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey, my lawyer friend and I, and if any of you have seen the verdict with Paul Newman, James Mason was on the other side of, of the courtroom with Paul Newman and he's one guy against the establishment and there I was with my attorney and we walked in and we sat down and Allstate by now had replaced their New Jersey attorneys with house counsel from, from Illinois. And here come four guys in suits that were each like $5,000 with zero Halliburton suitcases. And they come strutting in and sit down. State Farm guys come in with $10,000 suits and zero Halliburton suitcases and they sit down. And then walked the five Supremes, none of whom was Diana Ross. And they sat down <laughs> and this guy from Allstate stood up and the, Supreme Court, uh, the head Supreme Court justice says, sit down. There's not going to be any testimony. We've looked at the testimony. They win, you lose, pay them. <laughs> it was one of the happiest days of my life. And so in the state of New Jersey, okay, if you're involved in a motor vehicle accident, somebody wants to do a thermogram, it's law. It is case law in New Jersey. And it, it, the fight lasted me about 11 years. Uh, but I developed such a passion and belief that this was the diagnostic test of the future. It's a passion that now more and more is becoming rewarded because I was told earlier this year that the government has now mandated that the Potomac Institute in Washington, D.C., which studies medical devices, they want them to go research thermography and what its value should be in the world today. So the government is now pushing thermography. So with all the negativity that you saw that has nothing to do with me for mammography and the fact that now the government realizes what's going on, the FDA is being sued by people who, who were, were wiretapping them because of the fact that they wanted to, to sort of blow the whistle on mammography. Thermography is going to take a greater and greater place in the, in the medical community and I couldn't be any happier because I believe in what it is and it's probably very apparent to you. So let me show you some thermograms and let me tell you what they mean so that you can understand how simple this is. The picture on the left is a picture of a woman who came to our office and had a thermogram. And, and if you look at it, I'm gonna step down here for a minute. If you look at it, this being the center of the chest, the right side should look like the left, but it really doesn't because this is blue and you've got some green here and you've got this little orange thing up there. So when you look at it, what's apparent is that it's not symmetrical. And so she went home, as the, as the heading says, and she eliminated caffeine, and she eliminated sugar, and she eliminated animal fats. And lo and behold, she came back six months later, and the picture on the right is the picture of the same woman six months later with the dietary changes that you see. And that is a symmetrical thermographic study, also known as a normal thermographic study. It is, it is the value, but one of many of what happens when you change your diet and when you implement the right kind of uh, healthy lifestyle choices that you, again that you've heard about today. Okay, so we have women who come in to us and said, uh, I want to have this done, I've had a mammogram done, the mammogram doesn't show anything but I think I feel something and so what you get is you get black and white images like you see on the right showing lots and lots of blood vessels. We have the ability to measure the temperature around the nipples. All those circles that you see on the left type, side picture are circles that I draw 
because I'm marking up what we call regions of interest. And really, you don't have to go any farther than to look and compare the two sides and see that there's a huge difference from one side to the other, indicative of some kind of abnormality, which, when correlated with her clinical situation, in this particular case, led to a biopsy, which in turn led to the treatment of the cancer that she had. Uh, a woman comes in with a mass. Uh, we did the thermogram first. She went ahead and ultra had an ultrasound that was normal. She had a mammogram that was normal. She was relentless, so she went and had the biopsy. The biopsy was cancerous. And quite frankly, if you look at the black and white picture on the, on the right-hand side, to your far left, you see an area that looks almost like a diamond, uh, like a home plate, uh, like a baseball diamond, uh, which matches up with the heat picture in the black circle on the other picture, which clearly has indicated to us there's the area that you need to go. We've told them exactly where it is, which corresponded to the mass, which corresponded to what ultimately was a cancer. A woman walked in with skin changes on the right breast, to, to your far right on the picture, and, and she'd had a mammogram, which incredulously was normal. And again, just, these are just some instances of people coming in and having diagnostic testing that, that, that the, the mammograms, the ultrasounds, don't match up. Uh, with the, the clinical presentation, which is clearly indicative of at least something bad going on, if not cancer, and the thermogram is showing the heat pattern in the body, the physiologic change in the body that corresponds to the anatomic lesions. None more so than this one of, of a woman who had normal mammograms for nine years, five years of normal ultrasounds, three years of normal MRIs, and found her own mass. Now, some interesting statistics. Number one, 70% of all breast cancers are found on physical examination, 70%. Mammography has an inherent uh, false negative, meaning that the test is reportedly normal, but there's something there, has an inherent false negative of anywhere from 15 to 20%. If the woman does not have dense breast, the woman has not had surgical uh, implants, has not had surgery and scars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, each one of which change the risk, the, the uh, credibility of the study and lower its diagnostic capability. So 80% at best compared to the physiologic studies of thermography, which by world literature show a 97.3% correlation with breast abnormalities. So now on the one hand, you've got 80 to 85% best case scenario against 97.3, which to me makes it fairly simple. Additionally, that, that number can be skewed, as we said, and because of the dense breasts, and so many women with them, so many women with, with fibrocystic breast disease, how do you know as a clinician, and if Dr. Warner were here, I'm sure she'd agree with me, how do you know as a clinician if what you're feeling is a cyst or a tumor, especially if somebody has polycystic breast disease? And the answer is you don't. I do. Because cysts sit there. They don't generate any heat. They don't have any activity. They're not growing. They're not active and they're not growing, they're not generating any heat. If they're not active and not growing and not generating any heat, then you leave them alone. So I've had people who come the other way. They have a mammogram, they come to me and say, there's, there's something there. I don't want to have a biopsy. What do you, I don't see anything. Now, I don't ever tell somebody not to have a mammogram. I have a license in New Jersey that hangs on the wall and I like where it is. <laughs> and so I'm not going to stand here and tell you not to have a mammogram. But then again, Susan didn't tell you not to drink Mountain Dew and eat chocolate. She just told you what happens if you do that. So I'm going to tell you, you have to make up your own mind. It's your choice. It's between you and your healthcare practitioner. But I'm also going to give you the statistics that aren't mine. And I'm going to show you pictures that are. And I'm going to explain to you what happens when you make the changes. If you don't choose to do that, that's your choice. Because make no mistake about it, you're going to get beat up by healthcare practitioners. What do you mean you didn't have a mammogram? What's that thermo stuff? I never heard of that. Must be new. What do you mean you're doing this? What do you mean you're not doing things conventionally? And if you have breast what do you mean you're not taking tamoxifen and radiation? Right? It's your life. We're talking about proactivity here. We're talking about decision making. Okay. Here's a woman who on the left-hand picture had what I thought was a breast cancer physiologically. And I said to her, you need to get something done. And she said, I'm fine. Nothing's going to happen to me. And six months later, what happened was that the right breast was so hot it was basically on fire. And all that orange that you see on that right-hand side is the, is, is the progression of the breast cancer, which unfortunately ultimately claimed her life. But the bottom line is that the first one was abnormal, and intervention should have started there. 
And the second one really showed a progression by which time the, the, the intervention, whatever she chose to do, became much less valuable. So we're back to early intervention, early detection, early um, lifestyle change. Okay. So we now talked about breast thermography, uh, which is what we do mostly. Um, and I, I've sort of streamlined this because it's late in the day. We're going to have a little bit of a panel discussion. But let me talk to you very briefly about a couple of other things. We do neuromuscular and facial thyroid studies. Now, neuromuscular thermography is not to be confused with a total body scan. We do not do total body scans. What we do is we do thermography in individuals who have nervous system-related or nerve-related abnormalities. Example. Gentleman goes to the, to the doctor, he was in an accident, he's got back pain, the back pain's running down his leg, he's got numbness and tingling and burning and whatever kind of symptoms he has. So the doctor does what doctors do. They do a physical examination, maybe they take some x-rays, they get an MRI, maybe they put them through an EMG, whatever, and it all comes up normal. And so now what you have is somebody who's being told by the doctor either, A, I can't figure out what's wrong with you, or B, there's nothing wrong with you, you must be crazy. And the, and the gentleman walks away figuring, well, it's one of the two, but he doesn't know what to do. That's the value of neuromuscular thermography because we look at portions of the nervous system that none of the aforementioned tests do. We're looking at the physiology of the body, of the nervous system, and so we can look at sympathetic dysfunction, we can look at sensory abnormalities, and we can provide yet another piece to the puzzle of those individuals. And since back-related injuries are the number one cause of missed time from work in this country, uh, a lot of people out there with inconclusive back studies. So uh, let's talk about proactivity. And before I do that, um, uh, my wife, Leisha, is here. And I, I want to acknowledge the fact that she's here because she has reached so many people. And she's the, the first line of contact. She takes the pictures. She's responsible for most of this. And she's responsible for me learning at a very late point in my life that there is more to things than taking pictures in conventional medicine. So I'm going to take this film thing to acknowledge her presence and her input into all this. And while I'm standing up here, it really is on behalf of both of us. So when you call, you will speak to her. And when the pictures come, she's the one that takes them. And, and that being said, I'm going to move forward and, and, and look at what really turns out, in hindsight, to be a compilation of everything you've already heard today. Now, we did not discuss this among us. Everybody that preceded me on this dais and has spoken today had their own agenda. And it turns out that when you look at this, eating organic foods, eliminating commercial cleaning products, which is something we don't think about. You know, what's in those products that we're spraying on? What's in the, the glass cleaner or floor stuff? You know, how toxic is that to our health? Pure filtered water. By the way, this water is really good. Um, uh, refusing synthetic hormone treatments. Uh, seek natural approaches to health care. Detoxify the body. Empower yourself with a positive outlook, an attitude of gratitude. What a wonderful comment, huh? So supplement your diet with vitamins and nutritional supports. Exercise. Find an avenue for stress reduction. Maintain healthy relationships. How important is that? Going home and being happy, or at least as happy as you can be. Explore your spirituality. I will tell you, as an aside, that in the portion of my practice that deals with pain, those people who have a spiritual basis of their lives get better, faster from pain than those who do not. Time and time and time again. We have up front breast health formula. And when you look at what's in that formula, okay, this is a product that we have embraced because it has six supplements in one pill. And we thought this was a really good idea. And when you look at turmeric and grapeseed and green tea and miyataki mushroom and vitamin D3, isn't that what we heard earlier? So. We have two websites, tdinj.com, which is the thermographic website, and as an offshoot of TDINJ, um, we developed what we call Health Through Awareness, which is really taking thermography and going one step further. It is, it is taking it and, 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 and having people, the, presenting them with the opportunity of holistic health counseling, presenting them with the opportunity of um, detoxification. We have a far infrared detoxification, what we call a pod. Uh, in the office, which is unique uh, because it's, it's, it's a one-of-a-kind device in New Jersey. It has uh, oxygen therapy and aromatherapy and vibrational massage. And you just lay there and get detoxified and burn calories and relax and listen to music. Um, all of this is available to see 
Uh, and, and we're happy to talk to people. We're happy to spread the word. We're happy that you're here and that you're going to spread the word. But both of those websites are available. We are located primarily on Brick Road in Marlton, which if anybody doesn't know where Marlton is, it's one town beyond Cherry Hill. We have how many off-sites? Eight or nine off-sites between Pennsylvania and New Jersey where we actually go to the area and, and we take thermographic images. There are four or five in, in uh, Pennsylvania and another, uh, another four in New Jersey. Uh, so the, the idea of thermo thermography for me has been a 30-year uh, labor of love. For you, it may be new that you've heard today. Hopefully, you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, because of the rather rapid way that I went through the thermography today, anybody that comes in and has an abnormal thermogram has the benefit of a phone conference with me to discuss that thermogram. I go over the pictures. I explain the significance. We discuss recommendations. We talk about ways to reverse it in a fashion that is natural. This is what we do. I thank you for listening. Let, let me just answer the question. Yeah. And the number one question that I get, and, I, and I'm sorry for not saying it, this is the number one question that I get. Is it covered by insurance? Um, it is uniformly the first question I get asked. And the answer is this. We, we do not accept any insurance in the, in the thermographic office. We do not participate in any plans at all. What we do is we perform the study and after that we provide you with a universal claim form with diagnosis codes and procedural codes for you as an individual to submit to your insurance carrier. To me, one of the great markers of acceptance of thermography is that five years ago, probably about 5% of people were getting reimbursed. It's now up to about 35 or 40% of people getting reimbursed for the study that we're doing. It depends on the policy. There's no uniform answer. It's not that Blue Cross does this or Aetna does that. It really depends on your individual policy. But more and more health providers, insurers, are recognizing what we're doing because more and more people are having it done. So I hope that answers the question for you.